Chapter 2 Ellen dreaded that trip to the pump. It would be good to stay in the safe warm kitchen and never go out. A crackling fire on the hearth made bright lights in the copper pans and on the blue china plates in the cupboard. It made the quilt on the big bed look like a field of bluebells and shone on the bunches of dried herbs that hung from the shadowy rafters overhead. Ellen looked around. This kitchen makes me feel happy, she said. It makes me happy too, mother said wistfully. I used to sew and knit with my mother here by the fire. She taught me my lessons here at this big table by this very window. On the table was a basket of clay curlers and combs and brushes as well as wig stand covered with a net and a half-made wig. White hair spilled from a wooden box. We used to sit here and curl and dress the wigs for my father's customers and help him make some of the wigs too, mother added. And now you and I dress the wigs for the red coat officers, said Ellen. Yes, said mother sadly. Here we are curling wigs for the soldiers who have come to defeat us, and there's not much you and I can do about it. These are terrible mixed up times, Ellen. Ellen knew that well enough. Ever since the British Army came to New York last summer, she remembered the night in August when the alarm had come to their village. The British had landed on Long Island. Her father's thin face had been grim when he locked up his schoolhouse and rushed off with his musket to join the other men in the village militia. That very night, the militia had marched off to Brooklyn Heights to help George Washington's army defend Long Island and New York. In spite of all her mother's pleading, Ezra went with him. He was only 15, but he could shoot as well as a man. We'll send those cutthroats back to, King, to old King George, he had boasted. Everyone knew the brave patriots could drive the British out. Washington had driven them out of Boston last year, hadn't he? But the British had three times as many men as Washington had and all of them well-trained in war. They defeated him at Brooklyn Heights, and they captured New York City. They drove his army north, and in November captured Fort Washington, where they took 3,000 prisoners. People heard the news in stunned surprise. Then, the British took Fort Lee across Hudson River with all of Washington's cannon. And finally, they sent what was left of his army scurrying across New Jersey. The colonists could hardly believe such news. They had felt so sure that the courage and the will to win would be enough to beat back the British. Where do you think Ezra is today, mother? Immediately, Ellen was sorry she had asked, for mother bit her lip and was silent. Only the good Lord knows, she said at last. If he's alive and isn't on a prison ship, he must have gone to Pennsylvania with Washington's army. Ellen knew that asking about Ezra had reminded her mo mother of the other news that had come to them after the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. Her father had been killed. Many men from their village had been killed that day. She and her mother had been all alone. Mother was nervous and upset most of the time and worried about what to do. When at last they had no more food in their storeroom and no money to buy anything and the November days were growing bitter cold, Mother had said, Our neighbors can't help us, for they have as much hardship as we. There's nothing to do but to go back to my father, Ellie, even if the town is in the hands of the enemy now. How can we travel, Mother? Ellen had asked. We must walk. There's not else to be done. And so they had walked ten miles back to New York. Grandfather had welcomed them joyfully and had given them the big kitchen to live in while he slept on a couch in his shop. The rest of his house was already occupied by British officers. Now remember, Ellen, Mother had said, we must be very careful here. Most of the people who have stayed in New York are friends with the British and want them to win the war. Not Grandfather, of course, nor any of his friends. Those of us who are patriots here in town must lie low. Just like rabbits in a rabbit hole, Ellen suggested. Mother shrugged her shoulders and sighed. Well, rabbits know how to act when the enemy is all around them. And I suppose even rabbits need water, Ellen grumbled aloud to herself. No longer able to put off the trip to the pump, she pulled on her stout leather shoes and picked up her red cloak. It was a good warm cloak that her mother had made, and it hung almost to the hem of her long wool dress. To stay safe indoors all winter would make her feel very happy. But of course, since the wooden bucket was quite empty, there was nothing to do but pull her cloak around her, cover her head with the hood, and start. She took a long breath. If she went very slowly, she might find that Dicey had gone home. Just go to another pump, Ellen, if Dicey bothers you, her mother said. Don't go asking for trouble. Walking slowly through the barber shop, Ellen passed the counter that ran along the wall. On the counter were five china wig stands with painted gentlemen's faces beneath fancy white wigs. They looked, Ellen thought, as if they were smirking at her. 
smiling like idiots, she said, and you don't even see that jar of leeches there beside you. The dark, slimy little worms lay quietly in the water that filled a big green jar. Barbers always had leeches handy to put on bruises and swellings. Ellen found them almost too horrible to look at. From the kitchen, she, sh she heard her mother call after her, Mind the slippery steps, Ellen, and don't talk to strangers. Mother always said that, every time she went out. And Ellen never talked to strangers. It seemed to Ellen that Mother worried about everything. With great care, Ellen crept down the icy steps of the barber shop and out into the street. The air smelled of winter. Snow and sweet wood smoke mixed together. It was only half light in the early morning, but already the apprentices were sweeping the steps of the shops and brushing the snow from the signs overhead. As nimbly as she could, she dodged out of the way of carts and wagons that rumbled along slowly while their horses slipped and slid on the icy cobblestones. It seemed to her that every man with a wheelbarrow barked at her to get out of his way, and every workman with a load on his shoulders seemed to give her a shove. People were cross on a nipping cold morning. When she walked with Grandfather on Sunday afternoons, things were different, for he was friends with almost everyone in the neighborhood. Even when they walked down to the Battery or out Bory Lane to the country, he always stopped to chat with friends. Jump aside, shouted three girls as they sloshed along with full water buckets. Ellen hoped, hopped out of their way, just in time to get hit by a snowball. Across the street, the Birkenkoff boys were knocking icicles down from the roof with snowballs. They hurled several at her but she pretended not to notice. She had not even reached the corner when a tall, thin man with a tallow-spattered apron shouted at her roughly. Look sharp now, girl, he roared as he pulled her against the wall, knocking her bucket from her hand and spilling his own baskets of candles. Down the busy street dashed three officers on big black horses. Without a glance to either side, they rode as if they owned the whole world. Drat those redcoats, he muttered the candle maker. The lordly way they push us around. He knelt down to gather up his candles. Did I hurt you, girl? No, sir, said Ellen politely. She began to help him pick up his candles. The more she delayed, the more chance there was that Dicey might have gone home by the time she reached the pump. The neighborhood pump was only two blocks away, although it seemed like a mile to Ellen. As she came near, she could hear the old wooden handle creak and groan. A group of women and girls were waiting in line to fill their buckets. They huddled in their shawls and stamped their feet to keep warm. Ellen looked cautiously to see whether Dicey was there before she took her place at the end of the line. The women were talking about the same thing they talked about every morning. High prices. The high price of wool, the high price of firewood, the high price of cornmeal and flour and mutton. That kind of talk made Ellen worry about eating anything at all. Has Dicey been here this morning? She asked the woman ahead of her. She was an old woman with a work-worn face, dressed in a men's old a man's coat instead of a shawl. She's gone home, I reckon, muttered the woman. That's good. Ellen heaved a sigh of relief as she pulled her red cloak about her. I was hoping she wouldn't be here. What a mean one she is, said the woman. She seems to get pleasure out of pestering them that's smaller. She always pesters me, and I don't know why. She likes to see you run. I think she likes to make you go to another pump. But I never bother her at all. Why would she want me to go to another pump? The woman cocked her head to one side and looked at Ellen. Maybe because you're pretty and look well cared for, and she ain't. Pretty? Ellen was surprised to hear that. With her straight brown hair and her face as pale as a tallow, Ezra sometimes teased her and said she looked like a burned-out candle. Mother, of course, told her she was pretty. But her father only said, Don't make her vain. A good character is better than a pretty face. Just at that moment, there was a great commotion as Dicey came around the corner. She was dragging little Arnie Birkenhoff, holding him firmly by the ear as he squirmed and tried to get away. Don't you throw snowballs at me, Dicey shouted at him. Dicey's chapped cheeks were as red and rough as her flannel petticoat, and her eyes made Ellen think of a pig. She looked like a bold, scrawny public pig dressed up in a drooping wool skirt. Her pale hair was uncombed and blowing in the wind like a dirty handkerchief. Let me go, Ernie screeched. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dicey. Don't you do that again, Dicey warned him as she let him go with a shove. She brushed the snow from her chest and looked up and down the line of laughing people. When she saw Ellen, she put her hands on her hips, spread her feet wide, and cried. You trying to come here again, Wooden Doll? I told you not to come back here. Now just stand up to her, Ellen said to herself, but she couldn't feel her feet backing away. Bending down, the woman in the man's coat 
whispered to Ellen. Just pay her no mind when she tries to scare you. Don't look at her. Ellen looked off across the street, but Dicey kept up right on yelling. Look at that little baby in her red cloak. She shoved her face in front of Ellen. Afraid to look at me, aren't you? She jeered. Too scared to say a word? Leave me alone, said Ellen. I didn't hurt you. Dicey's face was red with anger and her little eyes were closed in slits as she sneered at Ellen. Why don't you bring your mom along if you're so scared? Here now, said the woman in the man's coat as she stepped between them. Just leave the girl alone. At that, Dicey's round, rough hands grabbed Ellen's bucket and threw it into the street, banging and bumping across the cobblestones. Get your water out of the gutter, she cried. Ellen turned and ran. She could hear Dicey call after her. And don't come here again. Ellen scurried across the street and hid behind a wooden cart. She hated herself for running, but she could not make her feet stop. She could hear Dicey's taunting laughter. Don't you come back here, putting on your fine airs. A workman with a load of kindling on his back kicked her bucket out of his way. Ellen scrambled in the gutter to get it and set off for the pump two blocks farther away. She was so angry she stomped along, kicking at the stones in the street and hurting her toes. I wish I could be invisible, she said to herself. I wish I could watch everything and nobody could see me. At the second pump, she took her place in line. Even here, a little old man was grumbling about the high price of firewood, and the woman talked about the high price of flour and wool and mutton. Always the same talk. When it was her turn, Ellen pumped the wooden handle until her bucket was brimming with icy cold water. It was heavy, but she knew that if she carried home half a bucket, she would only have to come back and run the risk of meeting Dicey again. On the way home, she saw the man who sold water from the tea water pump. His horse pulled a great round cask on wheels. Good pure water, he called. Good pure water for your tea, the best water in town. Ellen knew it was the best water in town, but it came from a well that was too far away for them to... to carry buckets home. Grandfather said he used to buy the man's water, but now he thought it was good for Ellen to go out. Good for me to go out, Ellen thought scornfully. Someday I'm going to stay home at all times and never get out. When she reached the steps of the shop, she could see Grandfather coming toward her, hopping on one foot while two carpenters in leather aprons helped him. To her surprise, she saw that he had lost his hat and his wig had fallen down over his eyes. He looked terrible. Quickly, Ellen put down her bucket and ran to meet him. What happened, Grandfather? Did you fall on the ice? Grandfather looked angry and very worried, too. I, I fell on the ice, he groaned. If it hadn't been for my wig and my hat, I would have knocked myself senseless. One of the carpenters tried to comfort him. Don't concern yourself, Mr. Van Horn. We'll make you a crutch. But Grandfather only barked at him. Better make me a new leg. That's what I need. He closed his eyes and moaned while the two men helped him up the steps. The door of the shop was flung open as Mother held out her arms to help him in. What has happened to you, Father? She said in a distressed voice. I've sprained my ankle, Grandfather said to her. I can't walk at all. And what's to be done now? Abby, what's to be done now?